Today, we get to have a conversation with Matt Stanzak. Who's this guy? Why are we talking to him? He's done what you want to do. Matt currently owns Good Old Days Pizza in Newtown, Connecticut, and it's a concept for sure that includes a cocktail den. But previously to that, he sold his original pizza restaurant after opening it in five years' time to move on to consulting on projects all over. We're going to find out why Detroit Pizza is something you need in your life, what investors want to see when buying a business, and how to source business when you're providing a service. Matt, tell us about Detroit Pizza and why anyone should care. This is On the Record with Matt Stanzak. I don't know, maybe it's like the Frico crust. What, like it, what exactly is that? It's, it's that... Spell it? F-R-I-C-O. Frico. Frico. Okay. Uh, and I think when you get those, those black steel pans... The cheese kind of caramelizes against the pan. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably the difference, right? Because usually you don't get that with Sicilian. You don't get that with grandma usually. You know, well, grandma's got like no cheese on it. Period. Kind of. Right. It's like it's not there. It's just all tomato. It's like and sliced. That is true. You don't really get that rich caramelization on any of those other pies. But I think that's that's the the main standout. Is it still as thick? Uh, no. I mean, there. If you if you cure the pan properly. You just kind of, you take like a, like a steel spatula, just comes away in two seconds. So like all your pans are seasoned beautifully. Beautifully. There's no sticking. It's like you've been using these pans for years, essentially. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you know, there's what, there's Lloyd's, there's Detroit Pizza Company are the big ones. And you can, they cure within like three, four times after you use them. And that's a half a night. You know, <laughs> they were so. telling a story at one of the bars I was at some point and uh, the old bar shut down and they brought all the pizza pans over to the newly purchased and open bar. And they were like, yeah, pizza's so goddamn good because they use all the old pans from the old place. They've been in operation for like the last 15 years. So yep. when you say cure your pizza pans, you're talking about like the same thing that we'd say when we we're talking about seasoning a barbecue pit or seasoning some cast iron. Yeah, sort of same as cast iron. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Kind of bake it for an hour, lightly rub it in some kind of fat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what we did with the thin and crispy pies. We kind of do like a bar style pie too. And I bought old used pans. They were perfect. <laughs> you know, instead of buying brand new ones for four four times the price. Um, so, so like, you're a pizza master, obviously. You're a pizza master. Not a master. I'm just, I'm just a pizza freak. Well, uh, <laughs> fair, fair enough, right? We're always learning in Constantly our worlds that we're always. living in. And, yep. and as long as you know that we're consistently learning and consistently getting better and trying new things and failing hard, yep. you know, you will advance continuously. But, like, mm-hmm. let's go before the good old days, right? Let's go back. Let's go back to the good old days. <laughs> let's take it back. Stanzianos. This was something that you put together. Mm-hmm. You put it together so well that people wanted it. Yeah. That's the goal, though, isn't well, it? Well, it took, it, there was, it was crickets for two years, though. You know, like, that's what nobody talks about. Like, it was, a, it was a success ultimately, but, you know, in a wasteland like Danbury used to be, you know, this is like 2009. So think about where 2009 was, you know? How was the, lo- we, we how was were, the location? Location was kind of crappy. It wasn't in, like, Mill Plain is a thriving spot now, but back in the day, it was, it was kind of like, by the mall, it was in like a shitty area, shitty looking strip mall, you know, and there was nothing beautiful about it. Um, and I just think, you know, the, it was the right timing in like the culinary world coming out of the recession, you know, that style really wasn't big up there yet either. Uh, social media just started popping off right around 08, 09, 2010. And I think that's really kind of what helped it. Definitely. So you opened it, went on two years without really too much yeah, action like, happening. Not too much. People just wanted, you know, like meatball pies. They didn't know what Soprasada was. It was a struggle. It was like they wanted slices. They didn't get that. We're only serving, you know, these 12 inch pies. Now it's super popular, right? Yep. Like it's everywhere in Westchester. It's everywhere in Connecticut. But it was like a, it was a struggle. Definitely. We weren't making money for two years, you know, just grinding, working every day. No life, you know, the whole the typical restaurant. So there's guys, though, that build brands, right? We build the brand so we can eventually sell the brand and then start over again on another passion project and see sure. where it takes us. It yeah, I didn't like know that. anything about branding back then either. <laughs> so, I was like, fuck it. I just want to cook and make awesome, you know, make awesome pizza. Like, I didn't know anything about branding in 09. Did you do anything different after two years or? 
Uh, yeah, I think like slowly, definitely marketing wise, uh, I started seeing what else was going on in the city. Roberta's was coming out, just started to kind of come out right around that time. It was there was like a renaissance sweeping the city with that style pizza. So I, I started to kind of learn, you know. So would, did you go in with the intention of selling it one day or? Yeah, I think that was the goal. Ultimately, okay. uh, ultimately, it was like, let's build it up and, you know, as, as much as I want to or can. And then ultimately, yeah, I think that was the goal. Definitely. I, I wasn't going into it. Hey, let's do this for 30 years. Right. You know, how long did it take you to actually sell after you started it? I had it for like five and a half years. OK, so and then I was just kind of fried, you okay. know, did doing everything. So, yeah. So, like, what are the important – because you're not the only guy that sold the business, right? There is a lot of guys listening that have probably sold some of their businesses or parts of their businesses. And what are, like, what are the factors that the investors want to see when they're coming in to buy something or a piece of something, whether it be investing or just buying you out altogether? Yeah. They're just looking at the books Yeah, up. I think you want to make sure it's making money, right? That That's a big deal. Uh, and then – I guess the potential, like it was still a new business, only five and a half years in, right? So, well, nobody wants to buy at the top for value that's not face value ish, right? Like, yeah. how much further can it go? Is yeah. this area going to keep on growing? All that can stuff. Can this place yeah. multiply and do more of these businesses as time goes on? Is the hood in good condition? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And not- yeah, how much is he going to have to put into it? Yeah, all that stuff, right? Uh, so, I think that's the number one, right? Is it in the green? Is it making money? Looking at the books. Um, you know, and like, is it busy? Is it busy every night? You know, and it was, it was like, we were closed Mondays, I think, but like it it got to the point after five and a half years, like we had such a big customer base, you know, people are coming in three times a week, which I'm sure you guys see too, right? Your regulars are coming in, even if it's just for a a quick pop or whatever, you know, like regulars will come in, you know, they're loyal. They'll come in, you know, two, three times a week. And they're, those people are, are paying your bills right there, you know? Our lunch is busy. Lunches were popping. We were paying the bills with lunch. You know, we were doing almost 100 pies for lunch. It's just like, so, so dinner is just all gravy. You know, I think, I think anybody that would come in can see that, and they're just like, hmm, you know? Like, like the dude wanted to put his own flavor on it, which is cool, you know? And, and that's, I think, what people look for, right? Is like, can I make more money at this business? It's already doing well. Can I, can I take it to another level? Um, that's, ma- that's probably the major factors, you know. How do you come to placing a value on, you know, what the business is worth? I mean, you obviously know also that the town continues its growth going forward. The areas are starting to get more populated because that's just what people do. They keep having babies and then moving out of the city and going Even north. Moving north, yeah. Exactly. And, like, where, where do you place a value on something that you know what the book number is, right? So let's just say the book number is 100000 a year is what you do. Mm-hmm. How do you place a value on what you sell a company for if you know it makes you uh, $100,000 and maybe, let's say, profit a year? Mm-hmm. Like, what do you multiply that by some number before you decide, hey, this is what this is worth? We do a million a year. This makes us 100000 in profit a year, just to keep numbers easy, obviously. Yeah, uh, I think that's one of the factors. Like, you take your revenue, multiply it by you know, a number, whether it be three, four times or whatever, and then take all your other assets in the business, you know, uh, you look around this place, it's like all your assets, your tables, your chairs, your walk in your hood, your TV is like all that stuff, add it up, throw it in there, throw it in that number too, you know? So that's, that's kind of what I did. Definitely. So lawyers come in, they draft up some things and a deal's made. Yeah. In Drawing out that deal, a lot of times we do these non-competes, right? Where you're a pizza guy, you can't open up another pizza spot. Yeah, for we had that. Time. We had that. Was it a long, it was an elongated time or more it so like It was five year? years. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the dude, you know, he wanted like, you know, it was, it, he wanted more. It was five years plus like a mileage, right? They didn't want me working, you know, in Westport or something like that, opening up a place. So I got that and I was fine with that. You know, uh, it was a little extreme, but 
we got to a point where it was, you know, both parties, I think, were happy. And now, look, now you got a pizza place. Now it's like, yeah, <laughs> six years later, whatever it is, seven years later, yeah. Okay. Doing pizza again. So in that time period, there's usually also this transition of ownership where you help everybody with the books kind of deal after the sale. Yep. Hey, this is how you do this. This is how you do this. This is how you do this. Like, what kind of things were you showing people how to do? Just basically, at, well, everything that I did, you know, I was there for probably two or three months afterwards. Um, just what I do when I walk in the door in the morning from lighting the fire to, you know, everything, how to order, you know, uh, if he's bringing in his own chef, you know, showing him all the little details, how to, how to build the pies, how to make the vinaigrettes, you know, like, um, you know, the greatest hits, the things that people come in there for, you're not going to want to take off the menu. So writing up proper recipes, you know, like handing those over, um, you know, end of night closing responsibilities, how we do it, you know, just stuff like that. Um, basically it. Basically like an elongated training period. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. This is how we do it. Uh, either, either follow it or do it your own way kind of deal, you know? Right. And that's crucial though. I mean, somebody buying a business, they want to come in, they want to make sure that they operate it the right way before they start throwing their flare factors onto it or, yeah. you know, whatever changes they might slowly make throughout that transition. Yep. And like you got to, yeah, you got to still set the guy up for success, whoever's coming in next and, sure. and, and let that flow through. Yep. So, all right. So you do three months of this and now they're on their own. Cool. Congrats. Awesome. Just curious. Just curious. Did they throw up an under new management sign? No. Right, no, that was another it. thing. It, like he didn't want it getting out, really. That yeah, you that's... know, because it was a very personal business. You know, it was like, you know, like every little nuance I had in there. I had pictures of like my family hanging up on the wall. All right. the re- all the regulars were like my friends. You know, so it was it was kind of like a very personal business. So it's like, how do you how do you just be like, hey guys, you know, we're having new, you know, the, he risked losing a lot of people, right? And he didn't want that, so it was right. like. So I was like, let's just kind of keep it hush hush, and you, you uh, also don't pay a premium for a business to then say, "Hey, look, guys, we're doing different shit now. Right. Yeah. We got new management." In yeah, here. no, it did it the right way. It was kind of like over transition, transitionary period, months or a year. You know, either add what he wanted to or change what he wanted to, and you know, and you, you're able to keep, you know, most of your customers, I guess. You know, so I always ask that because. I, I actually think the under new management time when I see it is yeah, not it's just sign. useless in any scenario, right? Because if you're buying or you're going into a business that's running well, you don't need to tell them it's under new management because be like, wait, that place was fine. Is this new guy going to fuck it up? Yeah. Right? It's a hard thing to do, man. Yeah. I would never buy a thriving business. I'm more like, I want to see it grow. It. I want to like start something from humble beginnings and see, see it birth, you know, see it grow and stuff like that. To, to jump in to a car that's already going 90 miles per hour and like figure it out on the fly and tweak it. You know, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. It's well, it you know, sounded like they came in when the car was going like 65, it was doing well, but it could have got up to 120 sure, maybe if, for sure. if it had ways and saw where the cops were parked. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. For sure. Yeah, no, no doubt. All right. So then right. You move over into doing a little bit of consulting work. You're okay. Just sold a piece of this business here or you know, the whole business we should say sold the business and you have a little bit of time to think, get thoughts together, put really forward moving plans together. And consulting is one of these things that guys just love doing. It's like, it's almost like freelance work where it's like, Hey, I've got this knowledge cap. I get to go play John Taffer. I go run into a place and I say, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Shut it down. Jokingly, of course. Hopefully you don't do it like that. But when you've built up now this year of knowledge over putting together a pizza spot, very well done to the point where somebody wanted to buy it. Now this gives you this accolade on your back pretty much where it's like, Hey, I know what I'm doing. Just successfully sold my business. Do you need help in your business? Sure. So I think one of the hard parts that guys have though in consulting is finding new business because you have to actually go out there and put yourself out. It doesn't just necessarily come to you. Maybe along the way while you're in your restaurant, it comes to you, but yep. you don't have time to do shit while you're in your own restaurant. Like, guy Done. lives here, right? Done. Like, you don't get free. Yeah. So, how do you find, how do you source the business? How do you get Honestly, these guys it's under just the belt? like, I just built up, uh, I guess, a reputation, you know, and people that were opening spots, whether it be friends of friends or personal friends, um, it just kind of like came, you know, and it didn't come, it wasn't like one a month, you know, it'd be like one every three or four months or something like that, you know? I was doing other stuff in the other time, but it was it was just kind of, 
you know, I probably did like maybe 10 total of 10 places, you know, and uh, it was just word of mouth, really. You know, and pizza's hot. Pizza's still hot, you know, so. Um, literally hot. <laughs> it's literally hot. <laughs> but I think that's kind of what it was. It was just word of mouth, people I knew or, you know, just having a reputation. Uh, how do you price, like, how do you price this, right? Like, we were just having a conversation in the street with somebody the other day. And they were approached about doing a cocktail menu. And he's like, how do we price this? Yeah. I'm like, well, some guys just take cash up front. And then other guys get a percentage of the cocktail sold, whether it be like 10 cents every cocktail, 20 cents every cocktail. Goes to them for some time period. Oh, if so, it's a so he's, like a part, he's like a partner then. So in some ways, there's a way to spin it out where nobody has to really come up from upfront money, but you can make a little bit of money over the course of time. So you just print out your back-end paperwork to say, Hey, this is how many cocktails we've sold over the month. Here's your portion of the funds. And you're saying basically whoever, like if, a, if you hired a, con, a cocktail consultant to come in, he would do your cocktail menu. Yep. So basically he kind of, he came up with those cocktails. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense kind of to me. It's like, yeah, he gets a little cut of those. His, like, those are his drinks. It's like being a royalty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's actually the word I was looking for. Correct. Royalty. But then it's like, you got to keep paying, right? You got to keep paying them well, after the he leaves. Frame. Well, yeah, until that cocktail comes off or until you move into having your own cocktail list or, you know. He gets you started. Yeah, the guy behind the bar might be real passionate and might be able to put his own drinks together down the line. And then, sure, is that guy getting paid? No, he just put it together. No. <laughs> yep. So, like, I don't know. Where, where do you price saying, hey, this guy wants to open up a restaurant. He knows absolutely nothing about it. Like, take him through this trial and guide him through and make sure that I mean, I always go high, <laughs> especially if it's like a money dude or a guy that has multiple places because you're not wrong. They need you. You know, it's like they don't either know how to they don't know what kind of mixer they need. They don't know what kind of oven. They, they don't know how to source it. You know, so it's like you're helping them from 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 the ground floor, not only with recipe development, training their staff, you know, just all the little details that that go into it, you know, that have taken me years and years and years of of error and whatever else you know to learn so uh how do you price it i don't know i just i always want to make more than like a think about like your top server on a busy night right they're pulling in i mean even at our place right now they're pulling in like two, over two a night 220 250 on a crazy night you know like i want to be making more than a server <laughs> you know at the end of the day right to put it bluntly yeah um so honestly, that's a really good way to look at that. Yeah. By the way, it's like I could just stay behind the bar and just serve some shit all night. I mean, I you, even even the chef should be making more than your top server. Yeah, you, you know, we well, spent. You hope some you'd time hope. talking about that, <laughs> but um, I don't know. How do you how do you price it? I guess it's individually. Is it like a little mom and pop startup, or is it a, a baller who's got three places? You know. So what like. Uh, were you just consulting for the whole five years in between? No. How many, no. Other, pro how many other projects came up? Um, I don't know. I'd have to count. Maybe, like I said, I probably did like, probably like 10 places total. Uh, I had a little breakfast food truck in the interim, so I parked that at a little farm. We would, we would crush kind of like breakfast sandos. Nooms mentioned that a little yeah, bit earlier eggs, today. Eggs is kind of an awesome name for that. That was truck. fun, and I still want to bring that back in a brick and mortar someday. You guys have like an old, like, you know, think about like an old diner that's just been sitting vacant for like, you know, 10 years or whatever. But, you know, it was like, you know, you know, like you walk in, the bar stools are on the left, banquettes on the right, like dim lighting, you know, like you I'm know. looking for something like that. I'd love to bring it back because it was a fun concept. People dug it. We could add alcohol this time, you know. We, we, so. may know, we may know of yeah, some of those spaces spot. available. <laughs> the, uh, how do you feel, though, about doing something like eggs? I'm a big fan of putting uh, descriptive words as a business name, but yeah. the only problem is you can't really like copyright it because it's a descriptor. So like, if I want to trademark something, you, I have to like do the logo. Yeah. What? You just like spell it with a Z or eggs? something. I think yours was spelled with a Z. Yeah, right? it was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. So was, you that, probably... was that in reason for that, though, or...? Mm. I don't know. I think I always had like stupid lingo on social media. I still do. Um, and it just kind of like caught. It was just kind of silly. It was it's fun. It gets, gets people going. It was different, right? <laughs> you know, it was like, it's kind of how you say it anyway. So yeah, I think that's, 
that's kind of how we. What's the one? What's the the West Coast one egg something? Egg slut. Egg, egg slut. slut. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Egg that's slut. what I was thinking about when we were talking about this before. They yeah. always call me as a name too. I'm like, all right. He, all right. he started yeah. as a food truck too, right? It did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I've seen. I'm a, sure you did. Yeah. I've seen Instagram posts about Just it. Just such a great name. <laughs> it is. You know. And the sandwiches look great too. But would that work for a brick and mortar like around here? I don't know. How, that how, kind of name. How long did you go on with the truck? I did it for a little over a year. Okay. Uh, Too much of a gr- gr- hands-on grind. Though, yeah, though, we no? moved away. We moved over like an hour away. So you got to be there. You got to be on the truck at like 435, you know, so it was a little much. And uh, I don't know. There were other opportunities and stuff like that. So my buddy, Richie, from, uh, he owns the Metches and, uh, and, and he's like, hey, I'll take it. He's like, well, we'll make it a taco truck and we'll use it for catering. So I was like, there you go. Boom. Problem you know. Solved. So. A little serial entrepreneurial uh, action going on here. Yeah, some you. luck. I think some luck mixed in. Right timing for sure. Luck's only handed to those that provide more opportunities out there in the world, right? Mm, mm. Uh, that sounded like it was going to be a quote, but that kind of, <laughs> fell, kind of fell apart at the end. I was like, <laughs> so during this time period, good old days starts coming around. And uh, the idea was kind of, you already know what to do, right? Like, it's fucking pizza place. We did this before, right? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I feel like you're like, I'm still learning. We're still tweaking. We're nine months in. We're still like, I feel like we're finally there, you know, like whether it be with uh, the way we do things or set up, setting up the kitchen properly, just little things, you know? So yeah, I felt a confident on how to set up a kitchen and how to, but there's so many tweaks along the way. And of course, during Rona, like just ad- adapting to that, you know, um, Take out delivery, like how to set that stuff up properly, you know. So we're not nine months in, so that's what but I'm trying to December. do the math. When December. is that? We opened, in yeah, we December. opened December of 2020. Okay, so I was introduced, kind of, I guess, an odd way to get introduced to the pizza. But I had COVID in April, okay. or end of March, early April, and I'm holed up in my brother-in-law's house because he was in Florida. So I commandeered his house in Trumbull, which is close. Oh, you took over it by yourself? Yeah. We, huh. we were actually on a golf trip, came home, and on my way home, I found out I had COVID, so I didn't want to go home to my, parent, uh, my parents, my wife and my kids, and like, give it to them. Yeah. He, he said, just stay in my house. The trouble, we're, we're in Florida. He gave himself COVID for a longer vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. But anyway, I'm holed up in Trumbull, and my cousin says, hey, I'm going to drop off some pizza. You know, there's this new place or whatever. I'm going to drop off some pizza. You got to let me know what you think whatever so he drops it off and his two boxes came right and he goes i'm gonna bring you both he, oh, he asked my preference you know do you uh, like thinner thin and crispy or square pies i know what he was talking about i was like i don't know square pies i don't know right and then he drops off two boxes he's like i brought you both i opened the top one it was a thin and crispy like pepperoni yeah. and there was one half a slice left in the whole box and i'm like what is what is this he's like i got hungry <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't hold it he like so all i got was the square pie he's like you don't have an appetite anyway <laughs> he's like all i got was the square pie but i tried it and he goes this is weird you're going to he's like eat that pizza and you're going to start like craving it in a, in like a week or so hmm? wow so i was like all right i ate the pizza it was good i was like all right this is good pizza the first time i had good pizza and like since i moved out of the westchester area and up to brewster yeah this is not going to any pizza in brewster nothing but, Nothing. I live in Pauling. I live above you. <laughs> Give me a spot. I mean, well, no, well, now I got a spot. <laughs> There's like, nothing. They, so a week later, whatever, I went back to Brewster, and I kind of forgot about it because I don't go down to Trumbull that much. Then in the summer when my brother-in-law's pool was opening up, we were starting to go back there. We have to take 25. Mm-hmm. And I'm coming we pass back it. With, yeah, we pass it. And I'll come back with my boys. I said, you know what? We're going to stop and get pizza. We went in. I haven't had it now in like a couple months. Yeah. I said, we're going to stop in and get, get pizza. He's like, where is this place? Like looking around. I'm like, no, it's down there. See the sign, whatever. So we got, we got a pizza. I got a couple of pies. I brought it home. And I must have had it like four times since then. Wow, cool. Because I got the one. And I, would tell, I told my cousin, I'm like, yeah, you're right. Now I can't stop getting, can't stop I can't stop getting the pizza, particularly the vodka pie, because the vodka sauce is banging. Thanks, man. But... That was my weird introduction to good old days pizzeria and cocktail den, which I destiny kept, destiny kept staring at <laughs> cocktail den and wondering what that meant. What does it mean? Because I've never seen cocktail den like that wordage before. It's a cool spot. You guys got to come at nighttime because that's when it really kind of shines. It's like it's just a it's a basement 
of an old inn. Like it's kind of dank and you know, uh, the lighting is super dope. Like just candles. I really... hadn't heard the word dank used in those terms <laughs> yeah. without like blunt being thrown somewhere in there. It's true, but, um, you know, it's just like a great cocktail program and pizza. That's really, you know, that's it. It's in a basement. Do you get like a later night crowd in there as a... not really okay. yet? Every once in a while. Yes. Yeah. You know, and those nights are fun. It's like you look around and there's, you know, three big tables still full. They're still drinking. It's 11 o'clock. It's rare. You know, music like old school hip hop's going. You know, it's a it's a good vibe, you know. Uh, but but not every weekend is there like a late night crowd yet. Yeah, you know? that's yet. the key word. Yet. Yeah. And that typically just come that typically just comes from who's humming on me. That typically just comes from uh, the marketing side of things. So, like, you could easily pack that place. Uh, you do the old school things, print a bunch of flyers up, hit them into cars where you know there's youth yep. or outside of other bars. Maybe not outside of other bars. You don't want to start a war by any means. <laughs> but, like, yeah, we used maybe to go and put flyers in the cars at WCC, and then we'd pack the house, like, over the next week. I haven't seen flyers on yeah. cars. Bring back so flyers. Done, like 20 years, probably. Well, this is the conversation that we've been having today earlier was the, the menus. Give us real menus. I want to feel them again. We're done with the QR codes. I don't care if other hands have touched it. You don't have to sanitize the menu. Just give it back to me. We're good. Like that's, Agreed. That's hate the world the, I'm hate in. Hate the QR. Hate the QR. But I don't know. I'm still getting hate, you know, uh, hate DMs from people about the mask situation, you know? We wore the masks for the first we follow the mandates, right. you know, absolutely. Uh, any server, anybody who, who, who still wants to wear masks, wear them, you know. Um, but we still get hate DMs from, from you know, I can't believe your, your staff isn't wearing masks and stuff like that. It's like, what, you know. You get hate DMs that they're wearing them or not wearing that them? They're not, that they're not. You know, wearing. because there's no mandates where we are in Newtown, Connecticut. Right. Um, but, the, but some of the surrounding towns do, like Danbury, you have to. New Haven, you have to. Um, Stanford, you have to now. Really? Oh, yeah. It's like, it's so ridiculous. So, I don't know. I feel like we're not out of the woods yet. We're still, like, navigating the waters, you know, and how to operate and how to appease everybody, you know? We battled the same decision because we, you know, as soon as they took the mandates away in New York, we all wanted to take them off because it's, and like, breathing my own hot air for, like, 10 hours can get old really fast. Yeah, it's terrible. But, uh, you know, we had, we did this, we thought about it and we kind of decided to just keep wearing them for the time being kind of, so you're still you're still we're still that. wearing them yeah as a thing but just just based on nothing except for like you just mentioned if like people are still going to be put off put off by yeah, it. i don't want to lose one customer because of it you know yeah, that's yeah we're, what I'm, we're that's thinking I mean. about going back we we figured if if you don't want to wear a mask you're probably not going to be upset if someone is right and if you are still about wearing masks you probably are going to be upset if someone isn't so we played like it's air on the side of caution if we wear the mask no one's going to be upset where maybe someone is upset the other way so we'll just rock that way for now can't really you know i don't know that was our that was the way we came at it i, I don't this is not a right or wrong decision in this way but it's not yeah what's i don't want to wear them by any <laughs> means i would rather not but well, that's a that's a good comment and thought process too is uh, what's the age demographic that you have coming in it's it's mostly mostly like people who are established in families. I'd say like mid thirties to like sixty year old. Okay, so uh, these people do kind of care about the mass a little yeah, bit more than the younger generation. You know, that... definitely. You know, they have money up there for sure. Um, so yeah, I agree. They they definitely care more about that. I find I find more it's the families more because the kids can't get vaccinated or whatever. Right. You know, so I find if you have a young family. They're gonna mind a little more than, Everyone you know, else. if you're like a nightlife kind of bar yeah. where your demographic is like twenty to thirty-five. But you know, whatever. then you also have the mask psychos who think the mask is everything and prevents COVID a hundred percent. You know, and it's like you, you're not arguing with these people. You know, it's it's. Uh, I'm not trying. We're we're not trying to lose business. We're trying to do the best we can. You know. Um, we just had a, a bar expo last week, Bar Convent Brooklyn go on, and they made a last-minute decision to kind of require masks 
and vaccination cards. Ooh. And it really, really hurt the turnout a lot. I had a list of like 15 guests that were to come out and everyone was sending texts across. Do you really need to be vaccinated? Do you really need to be vaccinated? And I'm like, hey, that's what they're requiring at this point. I don't know what to tell you. You could source a vaccination card somewhere, maybe. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what to do, but, you know, choices are out there. We should say we don't ind- endorse sourcing vaccine cards. I wouldn't say that. I'd let people choose what they want to do in the world, you know. I'm minding my business over here and staying down my straight and narrow. Uh, but these things are kind of business altering in a lot of ways and you know some decisions that are made we may think are the right decisions i'm not saying this on any of your decision making guys just put that out there but the choices that you make yeah they can hinder or help the business out a lot so i mean i get what you're saying just where you can keep the masks on because it's not going to piss anybody off like if i show up to your bar and sit in the corner and everyone's wearing a mask i'll just be like all right, I'm in like a mask wear zone and I'll continue drinking my beer. But then you have some people who will sit at the bar and be like, why to the bartender, why are you wearing the mask? Take the mask off. Come on. Yeah. So it's like, you're right. You're right. Well, because I have not seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Because there's bills to pay is why the mask stays on because I got (laughs) to keep showing up to my shifts without getting terminated, you know? So why did you wind up settling in the town of Newtown for good old days? So my buddy owns a restaurant, Sandy Hook. Uh, and he approached me. He's like, Hey Matt, you know, one of my customers wants to renovate this old inn. Uh, he's like, do you want to be the chef? And I'm like, absolutely not. It's a, it's like a 200 (laughs) seat restaurant. They're doing catering. They're doing weddings. Like it's not my style. You know, it's, it's, I'm more into like small niche pizza, you know, like crafting every pie and, you know, just, that's kind of my style. Um, and so, you know, I did a walkthrough with him one day. It was the summer of 2020. So things were kind of quiet anyway, right? So we went to the basement. And the basement of this place used to be a dank, kind of like speakeasy. They didn't do food down there. There was no kitchen. But it was just like a, like a creepy, like, swingers den down there. It had, like, <laughs> like, uh, like shag carpet. You I know, it was, it was really weird. And, you know, I said, I said, why don't we do pizza? So... We kind of partnered up in, in the endeavor. I was like, let's do pizza. You know, these are the styles I think would be cool because it's really not in the area yet. Uh, we're not going to do wood-fired pizza because it's been done. It's in, it's in the area. Um, you know, let's let's do that. Let's just try to do this. It's, it's a pandemic. I think we can crush it with takeout. You know, mi- uh, minimal kind of, uh, you know, investment. It's really just the oven, you know, some other minor things. Like, we're not putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into this kind of, you know, um, investment. So that's a serial entrepreneurial attitude too, where it's like, how little can I do? How little do I need to put in to start this business up to yield pretty good results? Yeah. And I mean that you hit it right on the head. So let me ask you, how much of the business do you think is takeout at this point still? Some nights it's half. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like even if, you know, uh, like to me, that's all, it's all gravy, right? It's like having a bigger dining room. Well, it's pizza, but yeah, it's all gravy. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just kind of like it's it's uh, what's another? Yo, did you have a kid re- recently with all these dad <laughs> jokes that you're coming out with? I've been watching a lot of Modern <laughs> Family, all right. <laughs> but I always happen. look at it that way. It's like if you if you're if you're doing like a hundred pies and takeout, that's like having a restaurant of this size almost, you know. Um. So yeah, some nights it's like half. So I mean that. Is kind of, are we still, where are you at Mamaronic as far as the business goes with takeout? Takeout? 40%. Okay. Yeah. So these are high numbers and we're still Even on a weekend? These. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And keep in mind, this place is closed right now still. So they've been channeling all the newer shell orders to the Mamaronic. Yeah, that phone, phone number rings over there. So. Oh, damn. Yeah. Wow. So this kitchen's operational or no? It will be in two days. Ah, that'll be nice. Which then <laughs> yeah. you can handle that your own takeout nice. orders again, huh? Yes. Nice. You're going to bring back the exact same phone number, 813-866? This, yeah, bring the phone number back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll bring it back. We'll bring it back. Uh, but uh, All right, so shirts. high takeout, right? You got a handful of people coming in still as well. And again, when you talk about, like, what won't fail, pizza. Like, people are going to order pizza no matter what. Yeah. Now you're providing a different type of pizza for them to order. So you're going to stand out in the sea of pizza. Furthermore, the pizzas that you're doing are not just a regular pie. 
like you're doing a handful of crazy pies. Yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, it's this, it's the same kind of like m- mantra, mantra. Like you know, use really good ingredients. We source locally always. That's just that's just the way to go, right? It's like I have relationships with farms. We're getting our fresh tomatoes, our zucchini, everything else. You know, so I think if you if you start with a really great ingredient, you know, uh, manipulate it as little as possible, you know, and just, you know, give give them something different. We're not doing, you know, greasy New York style. You know, we're, we're doing two different styles that are kind of new to the tact. area, which I love, which I love on a, on, a, on a rainy day. I'm not hating on it. But, yeah, I just think it's it's. It's uh, minimizing your risk. You know, we're, we're not opening up. You know, it's like it's like during these times, maybe open up like a burger spot or, you know, something where you can minimize it. You don't have a, a, an investment that's five hundred thousand dollars or, you know, uh, when we talked to Dan at uh, or an oak or an oak. Thank you. They were opening up a new style of restaurant that could be very in and out. And it was sandwiches pretty much. Right. He yeah, dumbed down the menu sure. for it. Yeah. I think they actually just recently shut down the main uh, the main building. The reopen people can place. order online for him, right? Yep, sure. Yep. And there's nothing Brilliant. in it. It's just a, a bare box. He said pretty much. And so you come in, you get your order, and you go out. And you know, this is the navigating of COVID. Like and one cook in the kitchen, dropping fries, putting together sandos. Yeah. So I mean, you're Smart. talking about you know, in some ways, safe foods. You, you win. I mean, but you're not just doing safe. You're not really that safe with your pies. No, I Nooms, definitely saw Nooms about brought a pie it up. with uh, some shaved Brussels sprouts and Parma cream on it. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, Maybe. that's definitely not safe, but it sounds delicious. <laughs> well, I'm, but I'm the funny thing it. is, like, at the end of the day, 75% of the pies we sell are red pies with sausage, with pepperoni, uh, you know, uh, vodka, straight vodka pie. So it's those are the pies that are that people want in Newtown. We're still learning, like, the... The demographic, I still I definitely still feel like we're still learning, but well, so say, we do throw in the different ones that you know, like Brussels are coming back in the season yeah. soon. We're going to throw that on. Tomato pies are heavy now. Zucchini's heavy now. So like we'll mix in those fun pies. We were, just to, we were about to order the zucchini with the goat cheese. Yep. But then you were closed. <laughs> <laughs> That's stupid. So uh, with. You just said 75%, you think, are the safe pie definitely, that's coming in. Definitely. And you're providing it because of such. That ties back maybe to the demo of the 30 to 60-year-olds that you have coming in where they're not maybe looking to venture too much too far. Yeah. Uh, the question is, like, are there kids in this town? Are they going to turn 21 at some point, have a little bit of cash in hand, and start yeah. really rolling around? And, again, like you said— you went two years with uh, Stanzianos before like things started to really happen in there. So it's like, how long will it take until you you really hit that mark yeah. where you go, oh guys, we're there. Yeah. We're at that next plateau. Yeah, it's it's you guys get it. It's like always adapting or changing things up in some kind of way, you know, um, that opens maybe turns you on to a different demographic or. You know, yeah, like maybe that's what we do next is, is start slaying like the, the high school kids that get out. Maybe do like a jumbo slice and a drink for 10 bucks, you know, like I think that's our evolution next, you know. In the 90s, that was five bucks. Five. Right. Like, yeah, go to, this, where we're at. go to the city now and try to get like a like a slice. Let's see what it costs you now. Right. Yeah, at, no. at a good place. I mean, we were just talking about that. Like the cocktail menus in the city, the drinks are like 17, 18 bucks. Ridiculous. Like, every single drink, pretty much. And if you're in like more of a like lower mid end cocktail spot, yeah, you're paying 14, 15, 16 if you find something for 12 it's like that's happy hour yeah it's like this is where we currently stand in inflation zones like the price of real estate keeps going up everything else has to kind of follow suit with it you know yeah but it 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 usually doesn't in our industry i feel like yeah you know correct and i I did just see like 18 dollar burger on a couple menus and looking at that is like it's shocking yeah. Just remember, burgers being twelve bucks. It's, yep. it's not even that far it's off that from like <laughs> yeah. where we are, especially the way protein prices are right now. Yeah. But like, even salads, you know, like yeah. salads at, at some of the top places are eighteen. Then add protein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's well, that's like, the biggest. That's the biggest hustle of all time. It's eighteen, but add protein and it's twenty six. <laughs> add eight dollars for that quarter chicken yeah. breast that you put on there. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, these, it's these true. Are, these are tough things to try to navigate too, though, because. You don't want to be the first guy doing this. Like you don't want to be that guy. Yeah, that but you also don't want to be the last guy because then you know 
Oh yeah, you all the problem. Then you, you've been eating shit for the last year while everyone else was inflating their prices, and you're kind of still trying to stick to values of just staying home. You got to do it uh, in increments, right? Yeah, it's like that's kind of what I've always done. Is like one week, maybe. Okay, the margarita pizza is the pop most popular. Let's bump it up a dollar. Yeah. Nobody complains. They they usually don't. Sure. Every once in a while, you'll get that bad Yelp review, like, "Oh, they're too expensive," you know. But are we really for the quality we're putting out? Yeah. You know, it's it's. Well, do you then do the homework to navigate what other places they've reviewed and frequented to right. see what kind of person they are? I don't, I don't read but, the comments. Yeah. Don't read the comments. <laughs> oh, I'll go down a rabbit hole. You do that? I, oh yeah, it's real bad. I'll be up until four o'clock in the morning, slapping myself in the face with my phone dropping as I'm scrolling. <laughs> You know what's annoying about Yelp, though, is that you could have 10 good reviews, and you get that one bad review, and it just throws your whole shit off. I think and the like, only good good thing about Yelp is, especially around here, because you got hotels and shit, so if somebody is coming to the area on business, they're going to go on there. You know, They're going to go on to TripAdvisor, Yelp, uh, Google, whatever, Yeah. and you're, you're going to pop up because you might be in the top three spots. So they're going to try you. Otherwise, they wouldn't have known you exist. Correct. Right? Correct. So I think that's how Yelp is good for us. Yeah, that, I, and, the, that and the Google reviews. The, yeah. I think the Google has probably overtaken the Yelp. Has it? Yeah. Well, yeah. well Google, Apple. It's all right there. You don't have to go to a separate And they hit you as soon as you're sitting there. How was, uh, how was Smokehouse? How was yeah. good old days? They'll do it at the actual table. Yeah. 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 Well, they actually sent, a, they sent us a beacon thing, right? And it said, this is for free from Google. Just stick it in the middle of your restaurant. It'll help you get Google reviews, and et cetera. So I put it up there. I said, okay, fine. We put it in the middle. Then I realized, I read somewhere else. They, they go, don't worry about it. In two years, it'll just be like, it'll like self-destruct or whatever. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about it. But I realized yeah. it's, that's how they're, they're tracking. You yeah. know, So it's like this little beacon hits all the phones and they can yeah, track like pings every phone that where sits people restaurant. are going and wow. stuff like that. So that's why if you're sitting in a place, and I noticed... In our restaurant, it would hit your phone as soon as you sat down because the beacon knows you're there, and it says, how was Smokehouse? They didn't even sit down here. How was Smokehouse? Like, I don't know. I'll let you know in a second. Let me get, huh. let me it's going to be a week thing. before you see Justin during prime service roll around with a cart of cell phones <laughs> with Boost Mobile, <laughs> like just running around the restaurant. A lot of people over here, densely populated at 9 p.m. on a Saturday. You don't want to go there then. Uh, speaking, speaking of phones... Or Instagram. I don't yeah. know. That was a bad transition or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But it's my second job. Um, you got you have a interesting Instagram Instagram account. Yeah, my style's always been like a little unorthodox. I'm not a big like I'm not a big hashtagger. And actually recently in one of the meetings like people my the people that work for me, they're obviously younger, right? They're they're now in their twenties or even younger sometimes. So they're really with it, right? They're really with like Every little thing, algorithms, when to post, uh, you got a hashtag, uh, just all this shit that I don't either care about or whatever. Right. I just do it for fun. And like, hopefully people, people who get it, get the sense of humor are like, this is awesome. We got to go there. And it yeah. just trickles and trickles, you know? Dude, I, I um, love it because it's like you put up the stories and it's just, you know, we spend so much time trying to random. set up a picture and like have a certain like jay will say you got to have the overhead shot right like whatever. but also i'm in a basement remember my lighting yeah. is awful, yeah. no, awful. But I love it. like you'll just see like a raw picture of a salad bowl and then big letters oh like that like it looks so good and i'm like dude this just is stupid the best. stuff yeah <laughs> i gotta say i'm all about the descriptions i get caught i get caught in the descriptions Wait, is like, adam sandler really wearing that t-shirt good old nah, day i got a, i got a bunch more because i was just away for a week so i was fucking around with Photoshop. A whole yeah, I was fucking around Photoshop and Oh yeah, now I can but, yeah, 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 like I wanna talk. I want it I basically deliver it the way I want it delivered to me, like like we're we're like we're talking to each other, yeah. you know? So if you read it, you're just like, Oh shit, I, I was thinking that or I would say that, you know? Um and it doesn't also have to be all about salad or pizza. It could be flashbacks to the good old days or a movie that we all liked from my generation or you know, like stuff like that. So it doesn't always like I do it per, pretty unorthodox. It's probably not the best way to that they would teach it at Instagram school. Well, like, let's look. And, and that's important, though, too, because when everyone's going left, go right. Or when everyone's going right, go left. That's, <laughs> yep, that's I'll be honest, the, it feels more later. authentic. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Listen, yeah. I think there's ways, you know, like, like the way that Taco Daddy did it. They got millions of followers or whatever in a very short amount of time. Yeah. Like, that's great. I think that's awesome. And I probably should be doing it that way because this is business. We're in it to make money, you know, um, and I think a lot of businesses do that, right? They, they do it in a way where they can get quick followers, 
They're doing the hashtags because it makes the most sense. Well, they fell into a little bit of a a lucky hole as well, though, too, with the Instagram followers that were, you know, somebody of importance that was taking video of, you know, the the bubble uh, gun thing. What did John say? They got Charlie. Yeah, one of some important TikTokers walked in. Oh, okay. So, like, opportunity, again, is, like, there when you take advantage of it. And they noted it very quickly. They saw it, and they moved with it. And that really helped them, I think. Or any time, like, Christian comes in your spot or is at your spot, like, boom, you automatically get, like, another fucking 300 followers in, like, five minutes, right? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, that's, like, influence. That kind of influence helps out for sure. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. And furthermore, like, it doesn't... It doesn't always matter what it is if there's a consistent message, I think, and if the photos are clear enough. Mm-hmm. But, like, you're still popping up in somebody's story every time you post, and you're going to scroll by it, and it's like a little banner. Good old days. Oh, good old days. They're still alive. They're posting stuff. Good old <laughs> days. Oh, shit. That's the other thing, it. right? Frequency. Like, it's almost a full-time job. It is. And a if I'm bumping job. on a 12-hour shift, I'm busy. I'm short-staffed. Like, I don't yeah. have time to <laughs> sit down at a table some days to even yeah, eat, figure it out. let alone sit there for a half hour and just, you know, that's usually what I do. When yeah. I sit down and, like, have family meal, I'll just, like, blast the stories quickly yep. just to let people know we're there, mm-hmm. you know? But I'm, it's just. It's the same uh, thing I do, standing up, eating uh, whatever somebody didn't sent back to the kitchen and try to do the Instagram. Because that's generally what I eat on. The but it is a full-time job. Like you got to be consistent with it, otherwise you lose traction. Yep. Yeah. So tell me about the cocktails. Who's doing the cocktails? Yeah, so uh, there's two kids. There's this kid Shane. He's kind of just like, uh, you know, your, your man on the ground, you know, coming up with stuff. And there's Kyle, who uh, he used to work at a couple. He used to work at, a bar, I think, a Barcelona, the spread and stuff like that. So he's kind of a veteran in the, in the industry. Um and, you know, they just they put together a really simple program down there. We got, you know, we got great ice, great glassware. You know, um, it's just it's it's their New York City quality cocktail drinks. They're they're He's the, the reason why I love Shane so much also is because he's he's like me on, on the bar end. he's super meticulous in like it just in technique. You know, every drink is made like he's making it for a family member or, you know, like nothing is skipped. And I think that's so important to have somebody on that end. You know, like just not over diluting stuff like every drink is made with precision and care, you know, and I love that from from the first drink at 430 until whatever at the end of the night. You know, I think that's so, so important. Like he doesn't cut corners, um, you know, so like I said, it's it's all the all nothing was nothing was skipped. Ice, glassware, uh, you know, sourced libations, uh, all the beers, all the, all the beers are pretty much local. I mean, Connecticut you know, Westchester, everywhere, like everybody, there's a million breweries everywhere. So yep. we opted to keep things like really close to home and support, support them. It's funny. Jay just exclaimed earlier today that ice is the most important thing behind the bar. Followed yeah. by glassware, followed you by You learn that ice. over time, right? It just really is, <laughs> you know? So what kind of ice are you guys using down there? Um, well, it's not like pebble ice. We don't have like a cold draft machine Chips. or anything like that. But yeah, like we have, you know, he's, he's, he's doing the proper large, large uh, mm-hmm. formats for, for bourbons or whiskeys or, or stuff like that. But it's just like, it's something that doesn't melt, you know, like so quick. Yeah. Um, I think it looks good in the glass. Well, I think too, like, you know, the internet has provided such awesome accessibility. Like uh, me sourcing all these 1950s and earlier books in my libraries at home has made me think multiple times how some of them are cocktail books. He loves talking about books. I, I like the books. What do you want? How but many first editions do you have? There's a lot. See? But sure enough, <laughs> but sure enough, I, I think to myself often when I'm like looking at one of the books that I pulled out for some reason, this is how people used to source their information. It was like somebody books. wrote a book based upon whatever it was. They published it into a book, whether it be handwritten and copied or actually published. And somebody passed that book along to somebody else, and eventually that book made it halfway around the world or the country. And then you found out how to make some cocktails because some nerd put it into books and was like, hey, here you go. This is, read this. There's stuff in there. And I think that in the internet now has provided such great access to be able to see cocktails and see what's trending and happening in the world where now you're a little bit further away from the city where things are always happening, you know, at the drop of a hat. But these guys are seeing it just as fast as it's happening there. 
because they have the access to the photos on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And like, that's huge to be able to keep up now where, you know, we talk about cocktail cultures. There's not really that much culture, like the further north and away from the cities that you go. It's like you're in the middle of nowhere. But when you find these bars where you've got these kids taking care to make sure that things are properly diluted and measured out and they're doing something interesting and fun as a riff off a cocktail that they've seen in a photo in a city in an impactful bar, they could provide that presence for people coming in. And like over the course of time, like you're going to start seeing more cocktail nerds show up and start talking about the drinks. And but even going. Westchester, I mean, I'm not like hip in the scene down here because I don't live down here. I don't work down here anymore. But are there a handful of places where you can go and get a like a, a well made drink. It's less of a handful. It's a, it's a handful. Yeah, probably a handful, right? Yeah. Maybe some old school jaunts or an old school steakhouse or something like that. But um, I mean, if you go to a, an old school steakhouse, you're getting martinis. That's what's on their list. You're not getting much variation. Right. Uh, you'll see your Manhattan's. You'll see your old fashioned. Maybe a Negroni. You're not catching anything that's really out of the new. Uh, you know, props to the guys over at Blind Pig in White Plains. They opened up as a cocktail bar, and they keep on pushing their own limits. Every time I go in there and have a conversation with the guys, oh, Jay, come see, come see what I'm putting together. Take me downstairs to the fridge. Taste that, taste that, taste that. And it's fun because they're That's excited cool. about it. And you don't see enough people excited in the areas outside of the city. Yeah. And, like, it hurts a little bit to see that. So, uh, again, as time goes on, you start finding these guys that really do have a passion and a love, and they want to make your place stand out, like... The moment people catch on to see that, hey, you could order safe cocktails you know, here. And, and that, that inspires, that trickles. Like, I've been in this industry for over 20 years, but I work with a kid who's 30 years old, you know, using technique and precision making cocktails. Like, it inspires me. I get excited. I want to go to work every day and, like, watch him and, you know, and stuff like that and learn from him. You know, like, that, that trickles over. I think you just get better people from that. You attract better people, you know. People come in. To watch him make cocktails and to, to have his drinks, you know, or the other end of the spectrum. It's like you, 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 you stumble into this little pizzeria spot in Newtown and you're like, holy shit, like I just had a really well-made cocktail. Like it kind of surprises you, you know, exceeds your expectations. Exactly. And we know that's like in our industry that seldom happens are, 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 um, are they exceeded, right? If this episode put a little wind in your sails, go back a little further and check out some of our other great conversations with people just like you. Owning, managing, and running a business isn't easy, but we certainly look for all the gems that help you boost your cash sheets and help take business in the right direction. This has been On the Record with good old days, Matt Stanzak.